care what they know Your first name is free Last name is down But she will still believe In where we're from Man's white flower It's an every living thing Mind use your power Spirit use your wings Good afternoon my name is Reverend Dawn Daly Mack. I am a member of the Halifax Northampton County's Juneteenth Committee, and I would like to welcome you to our 14th annual Halifax Northampton County's Juneteenth Freedom Jubilee Celebration. Some of you may be aware of what Juneteenth is, and some may not be. Juneteenth is often called African American Independence Day. It has been the subject of city, state, and federal legislation in recent years, establishing it as a special day of recognition and as one of the fastest growing events in the country. The celebration of Juneteenth originates from Galveston, Texas, where on June 19, 1865, the word of the Emancipation Proclamation reached the enslaved, two and a half years after the signing. Today, Juneteenth is embraced and celebrated by all races and ethnicities in honor and in commemoration of African-American culture and achievement. In 2007, North Carolina became the 26th state to recognize Juneteenth as a state holiday. We celebrate this occasion virtually this year, but we were in person for the first 12. COVID has had many challenges and opportunities. One such opportunity has been the ability to reach people that possibly would not have come to the in-person event. Another opportunity has been the uncovering of health inequality in our country and the number of people working to change it. Our theme for this year is African American healers. Long before we were allowed to read or write or even aspire to be doctors, nurses, or researchers, we were healers. We were brought to the shores of this country with knowledge of herbs and minerals that were used for healing. Many of the medical advances, techniques, medicines, and instruments in the history of this country were often from the minds of African Americans who were never given credit. One that stands out is how Onesimus, an enslaved African, described to Cotton Mather the African method of inoculation against smallpox in 1721. Today, you will hear from Dr. Kismikia Corbett, a native of, native of North Carolina, who was instrumental in the creation of the Moderna COVID-19 vaccination. Dr. Corbett recently joined the faculty of Harvard University. She plans to expand vaccine research in her new laboratory at the university with the goal to create universal vaccines. You will also hear from retired Brigadier General Clara Adam Ender, who came out of retirement to volunteer to administer COVID-19 vaccines. You will also hear from local residents speaking on various topics along with poetry and music. Please turn up your speakers, sit back and celebrate with us. Greetings, thank you so much for your generosity, your donations of books, magazines, time and funding for this community library is greatly appreciated. This year Juneteenth celebrates 155 years of freedom. It commemorates the day freedom was proclaimed to all slaves in the South to ensure the freedom of all Americans. The Juneteenth Freedom Jubilee is a time for hope, rekindling memories, and making others aware of what Juneteenth is all about. Please continue telling others about this library. Together, we will help the town of Garrysburg in establishing a state-of-the-arts library. Again, I say thank you and hope you will enjoy the wonderful festivities that we have planned. Bring with the heart, Lord. 
spotlight someone. This person has worked very hard since June 10th began. She started the celebration in Garrisburg, North Carolina. There are volunteers who are faithful and who work with her. The first celebration of June 10th got a very slow start. This did not deter the organizer or the crew. It was the June 10th celebration that gave us the praise dancers, the African dancers, the flag folding, the poetry writers, the guitar players, the gospel singing, and more. The dream of this person had always been for Garrisburg to have a library. She saw the old Garrisburg School as the perfect place. That dream is now a reality. The first Juneteenth celebration got off to a very slow start. Attendance was low, but did that stop her? No. The organizers said, if no person come, we will still have a library and we will still celebrate Juneteenth. Dreams that come true are dreams that people continue to believe in, who are willing to work. This person is always seeking new adventures and to benefit our community. This is called growth. So today, let's put our hands together and applaud this person. A person who wants improvement and growth and is always ready to roll up her sleeves and go to work for it. She continues to remember and to add members to the committee as she moves on. So let us today say thank you to Dr. Beverly G. Underdo for her insight and leadership. Clara Wilson. I 
am Lenore Davis. I would like to read My Last Will and Testament by Mary Jane McLeod Bethune. She was a source of positive energy. Positivity is a source of good health. Born July 10, 1875 in Maysville, South Carolina, Mary Jane McLeod Bethune became a civil rights leader and educator known best for creating a private school for African American students in Daytona Beach, Florida. Now known as Bethune Cookman University. Born to enslaved African parents, Sam and Patsy McLeod, she has left her legacy upon the wall of time. Serving the African American community, advising U.S. presidents, and more. Rising from the homeless background, she became an icon of African womanhood. As a preserver and a woman of courage in the face of great social and economic challenges. My last will and testament. So, as my life draws to a close, I will pass them on to Negroes everywhere in the hope that an old woman's philosophy may give them the inspiration. Here then is my legacy. I leave you love. Love builds, is positive and helpful. I leave you hope. Yesterday, our ancestors endured the degradation of slavery, yet they retained their dignity. I leave you the challenge of developing confidence in one another. This kind of confidence will aid in the economic rise of the race by bringing together the pennies and dollars of our people and plowing them into useful channels. I leave you the thirst of education. Knowledge is the prime need of the hour. I leave you a respect for the uses of power. Power, intelligently directed, can lead to more freedom. I leave you faith. Faith in God is the greatest power. But great too is one's faith. In self. I leave you racial dignity. I want Negroes to maintain their human dignity at all costs. I leave you a desire to live harmoniously with your fellow man. I leave you finally a responsibility to young people. The world around us really belongs to the youth. For youth will take over its future management. Mary McLeod Bethune. Hello, this is Michael Ewer and greetings to the Halifax, Northampton County's Juneteenth celebration 2021. I'd like to thank Dr. Beverly Underdue and Dr. Mrs. Dawn Matt for inviting me to share a Black history tidbit. And this is going to be entitled The Twin Colleges of North Carolina. And to start this story, we're going to talk about the briefly the Civil War, which, of course, you know, Juneteenth celebrates the end of the Civil War. During that time period, during the conflict, the first Morrow Act was founded to establish land grant colleges and to uh, provide land and the establishment of at least one college in mostly Southern states, although some are in the North. In 1890, which was nearly 30 years later, a second moral act was passed by Congress, which 
required particularly the southern states to make provisions for black students to attend their land grant colleges and this included north carolina uh, the a m college which was located in raleigh attempted to make a agreement with shaw university to house an agricultural department which would be funded with these additional funds shaw university with great character indicated that they would temporarily house it but said that the a m college and really they were talking to the state legislature you would need to uh, build the blacks their own school if you would not let them attend with um, the white students subsequently the a m college for the colored race was founded on march 9 1891 by the state legislature also earlier, and this gentleman whose name is not as widely known as it should be, Hugh Kale, who was a representative from Passwatank County in the Elizabeth City area, lobbied to have a school built in northeastern North Carolina to educate Blacks. And that school was founded on March the 3rd and named Elizabeth City State um, Normal School for Colors, for the colored race. Finally, we would say Hugh Kell is the father of both what is now North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University and Elizabeth City State University. And he is that because he was the leading force in the establishment of both. And we know that as we recognize that he served on the Board of Trustees for A&T from 1891 in its founding until 1899. Of course, Elizabeth City State University already acknowledges him as a founder of their institution. And as we move forward, I hope that both of the schools will recognize that they are very special and unique. And at the time of their founding, they were known as twin colleges. And no other time in the state of North Carolina have two institutions been founded in the same, same legislative session. Also, it is important to note that both of the schools have significantly grown and have extraordinary programs. In 1972, both were merged into the University of North Carolina system. And sometimes it's easy to forget who your real parents are, but they are really both founded by the legislature. No other public HBCU in North Carolina was founded that way. They were all established as private schools. So once again, this is a very little known black history fact. But congratulations to the great accomplishment of both Elizabeth City State University and North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University, North Carolina's twin colleges. This has been a little known Black History Month fact, Black History fact presented to the Halifax of Northampton County's Juneteenth celebration, which is hosted by the Garrisburg volunteer public library. Have a great day and we look forward to following up and having a further conversation and other programming around these very significant facts. Alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. My name is Dr. Waikita Lane Holloman. I'm the current president. We are so delighted to share with you on this 2021 Juneteenth virtual celebration. In honor of your theme, African American Healers, we would like to share that we know how important it was to have trailblazers so that we today will be able to serve and work in medical professions. With that, we take time to honor our chapter members who served on the front lines during these unprecedented times with COVID-19.
Again, we, the Enfield Runner Rapids Alumni Chapter, thank you. And happy Juneteenth. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our flag folding ceremony. The flag folding ceremony represents the same religious principles on which our country was originally founded. The portion of the flag denoting honor is the canton of blue containing the stars representing the states our veterans served in uniform. The canton field of blue dresses from left to right and is inverted when draped as a pall on a casket of a veteran who has served our country in uniform. In the armed forces of the United States, at the ceremony of retreat, the flag is lowered, folded in a triangle fold and kept under watch throughout the night as a tribute of our nation's honored dead. The next morning it is brought out and at the ceremony of reveille, run aloft as a symbol of our belief in the resurrection of the body. The first fold of our flag is a symbol of life. The second fold is a symbol of our belief in the eternal life. The third fold is made in honor and remembrance of the veteran departing our ranks who gave a portion of life for the defense of our country to attain peace throughout the world. The fourth fold represents our weaker nature. As an American citizen trusting in God, it is to him we turn in times of peace as well as in times of war for his divine guidance. The fifth fold is a tribute to our country. For in the words of Stephen Decatur, our country in dealing with the other countries, may she always be right, but it is still our country, right or wrong. The sixth fold is for where our hearts lie. It is with our heart that we pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible and in liberty and justice for all. The seventh foe is a tribute of our armed forces. For it is through the armed forces that we protect our country, our flag against all her enemies whether they be found with, with or without the boundaries of our republic. The eighth foe is a tribute to the one who entered in the valley of the shadow of death, that we might see the light of day and to honor mothers for whom it lies on Mother's Day. The ninth foe is a tribute to womanhood it has been through their faith, love, loyalty, devotion, and the character of men and women who have made this country great have been molded. The tenth fold is a tribute to Father, for he too has given his sons and his daughters for the defense of our country since they were first born. The eleventh fold in the eyes of a Hebrew citizen represents the lower portion of the seal of King David and King Solomon and glorifies in their eyes the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The twelfth fold in the eyes of a citizen Christian represents an emblem of eternity and glorifies in their eyes God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. When the flag is completely folded, the stars are uppermost reminding us of our national motto, in God we trust. After the flag is completely folded and tucked in, it takes on the appearance of a cocked hat, ever reminding us of the soldiers who served under General George Washington and the sailors and Marines who served under Captain John Paul Jones, who were followed by their comrades and shipmates in the armed forces of the United States, preserving for us the rights, privileges, and freedom we enjoy today. Thank you very much. Greetings. Congratulations to the Halifax and Northampton County Juneteenth Celebration Committee. African American healers. Since the beginning of time, members in our community 
have been African American healers. And for that, we say thank you for your service. Congratulations, best wishes, and a special thank you from the lovely ladies of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, the Kappa Iota Omega Chapter, yours truly, Miss Waynette Kimball, President, and Miss Shauna Brown, Vice President. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Nurse Ev, and I want to quickly talk to you about Black Maternal Health. Black Maternal Health refers to the health of a Black woman during pregnancy, childbirth, and also in the postpartum period. That's so important because right now, if you don't know, we're having a Black maternal health crisis. That is a serious issue because Black women are dying every day from preventable causes related to childbirth. And I like to emphasize the word preventable because that means that this person did not necessarily have to lose their life. There is something that the hospital staff, the facility staff, whatever situation they were in, there's something that could have been done to prevent that death. And this is happening every day across the US and is not okay because we should have joy in birth. We should not have fear in birth. Black women should not be afraid that when they go into the hospital, they may not return home with their child. Children should not return home without their mother. The family unit should stay together. And we're working on that, making that happen. And not only am I a nurse, I am also a doula, fertility and birth doula, and I'm also a lactation education specialist. Currently, I'm running through some maternal mental health training, and I love that because you can't talk about black, black, black maternal health without talking about black maternal mental health because they both go hand in hand. Because what we know is where the mind goes, the body follows. And that's the founder and the owner of In Harmony and Health Fertility, Birth, and Wellness Services. I focus on making sure that my, my services come from a whole body concept. I literally focus on your mind, your emotions, spirituality, all your foundations. I pull that together so that you can use that to holistically have the birth that you desire. I like to look at it from a whole body perspective. We don't separate because everything comes together. And what we also know is that women, black women, you're strong, you're able, your magic and everything that you have comes from within. Even though they try to tell you something different, you have everything you need inside of you to birth your babies, to take care of your babies. You don't need anyone telling you that you cannot listen to your body and you cannot trust your body. What you do need someone telling you are your choices and your options and making sure that you understand that you literally are in control of your birth. This is your choice, this is your desire. But coming from a wellness perspective, I want you to also know that the health of your body matters preconception during labor and at birth and postpartum period. That's why Black maternal health is so important to me because as a Black woman, I also want to make sure that other Black women and other women of color are given a chance to have joy in their birth and not fear. So happy Juneteenth. And to learn more about Black Maternal Health, make sure that you guys are following all of the amazing Black doctors out there, the Black nurse practitioners. You have your Black midwives, you have your Black nurses, you have your Black doulas. Use your community, lean on your community to get the information that you need. Again, I am Nurse Ev and happy Juneteenth.
into a woman's eyes, what do you see? I see fear, frustration, confrontation. Have you ever looked into a woman's eyes? What do you see? I see pain, passion, and tears. Have you ever looked into a woman's eyes? Really looked into a woman's eyes. What do you see? I see love, peace, and harmony. I see a warrior, conqueror, a mediator. Have you ever looked into a woman's eyes? I mean really looked into a woman's eyes. What do you see? I see a daughter, a baby, a big fat lollipop. I see the sweet sugar cane and a wild mustang. Have you ever looked into a woman's eyes? Really looked into a woman's eyes. What do you see? I see her story telling history. I see eyes dancing full of life. I see my past, present, future in her sight. Have you ever looked into a woman's eyes? Really looked into a woman's eyes. What do you see? I see a teacher, a healer. I see a sadness, a survivor. Have you ever looked into a woman's eyes? Have you really looked into a woman's eyes? What do you see? I see humility, a scholar of proudness. I see dignity. Have you ever looked into a woman's eyes? What do you see? I see a river that flows so deep into the sea and her eyes so bright, woo, you feel her wings take flight. Have you ever looked into a woman's eyes? I mean really looked into a woman's eyes. What do you see? Answer me. What do you see? I see a world of love. That's what I see, a world of love. Beverly Underdue, and I would like to have a little conversation with you about aromatherapy. Aromatherapy is the specific use of essential oils by topical application and or inhalation. These oils are extracted from a number of plants. They are highly concentrated. 
Each essential oil has a specific property. Therefore, it is important to know which oil may be used and may be helpful for which condition. Essential oils may enter the body by a number of methods. My favorite method is that of taking a shower and using soaps made with quality essential oils. The lather is thick and soothing, and the steam also contains awesome essential oil molecules which are inhaled. My Balance Soap contains hormone balancing and antidepressant essential oils such as bergamot, geranium, and ylang-ylang. For relaxation, rest, and sleep, my go-to soap is lavender. Lavender also helped to soothe my mom who had Alzheimer's. Eucalyptus is an awesome decongestant oil and helps with colds and flus and soothes body aches. Peppermint, which is very stimulating and cooling, is another of my favorites. It's tingly and refreshing. It cleans the scalp and may promote health, healthy hair growth. There's a combination soap that is used, lavender and peppermint, which involves the best of both worlds, soothing and refreshing. Tea tree is one that is used daily, from head to toe and everywhere in between. It is antifungal, antibacterial, it soothes itchy skin, may help heal eczema, softens the skin to provide a closer shave, it cleans the hair follicles, which helps to promote healthy hair growth, soothes razor bumps, and also with the temperature getting hotter and hotter, it is used to repel insects such as gnats and mosquitoes. I suggest that you read about essential oil. There are lots and lots of books on that topic. And you may also contact the National Association for Holistic Aromatherapy. In the meantime, be safe, be healthy, and enjoy your Juneteenth. Did you know that heart disease is the leading cause of death of all people in the United States? Did you know that one person dies every 36 seconds in the United States from cardiovascular disease? About 655,000 Americans die from heart disease each year, and that is one in every four deaths. African Americans have a higher incidence of out-of-hospital sudden cardiac death in comparison with whites, and black people have the highest rate of cardiovascular death among all ethnic racial groups worldwide. Early intervention by CPR and defibrillation high quality CPR, including compression only CPR, and the use of an automated external defibrillator, or AED, immediately following cardiac arrest can reduce morbidity and save lives. African Americans are least likely to be trained in high quality CPR and the use of life-saving AEDs. Most are only trained when their jobs require it. Most sudden cardiac death occurs in homes and in the public, not in hospitals or in other healthcare facilities. In rural communities such as ours, it can take up to 30 minutes before EMS arrives. Many people die waiting for help because it only takes six or seven minutes without oxygenated blood in the brain for the brain to lose its viability. I believe that anyone can and should learn high quality CPR and how to operate an AED. If more community and family members were taught, more lives could be saved. If you or anyone you know are interested in learning CPR and AED usage, please contact Double D Health and Safety at area code 252-410-1717. I am a certified CPR, AED, and basic first aid instructor, and I can come to your location and teach up to four people at a time. 
remember, anyone can learn CPR. What we know is that this virus is in the same family of viruses like SARS. So it is akin and about 80% genetically similar to the SARS virus. Um, we know now, um, based on some of the transmission data from China, that the not only did the virus jump from an animal reservoir into humans, but there is sustained human-to-human -human transmission, and that's been documented several times over now. Um, including in a hospital setting with healthcare workers. Every day we're learning more and more and more. Um, obviously, because this is a novel virus, and even though we've been to this rodeo before with MERS and SARS, there's still so many unknowns. This is the protein that is on the surface of a coronavirus, and it is the protein that the virus uses to attach to the cell and then enter the cell. What a, a mRNA vaccine is, is we're essentially delivering the genetic material. So we're delivering the messenger RNA that encodes our mutated novel coronavirus spike the messenger RNA will tell the body to present this spike protein and the body will respond by creating an immune response. And hypothetically, if all goes well, then that immune response will then be able to see a novel coronavirus before a person gets infected and prevent that infection. We started this collaboration with Moderna because we wanted to utilize our antigen concept, so our vaccine concept, but deliver it via their platform. So what that means is that we take our sequence from the VRC and we give it to Moderna and Moderna develops the vaccine. And all of these things are things that we've done very a lot, actually, with uh, MERS and SARS vaccine concepts, including MERS mRNA. So we, we know what types of immune responses we're looking for in small animal models. And so we will be testing, evaluating those immune responses, and then we will be establishing a, a clinical trial. it would be the upwards of a year before we have data from those types of studies that would support a, um, a vaccine that is licensed for general use. Everywhere Go to 
I am Clara Adams Ender, Brigadier General, United States Army, retired. I'm a volunteer with the Medical Reserve Corps of Virginia uh, to give the vaccine. I chose to get the vaccine because I have taken many, many vaccines over my course of living that uh, had to do with diseases and communicable diseases that were causing us problems at the time. And so uh, I just considered that this was another one that we had to deal with. I made sure that I informed myself about the procedure and what went on in terms of getting the vaccine together and I was satisfied. I have had many conversations with family, friends, customers, individuals that uh, I have had to deal with in businesses. Uh, there were individuals who had real uh, concerns about what was going on. I made sure I informed myself so that I could talk to them about it uh, uh, and with logic and, and to be able to answer their questions and to, to do that. That's basically what a nurse does. A nurse is involved in doing that quite often. And so I was just doing my duty as a nurse. Uh, there are several websites that are out there from the uh, CDC uh, and also from the Virginia Department of Health and there are other websites that talk specifically about and answer questions that are most commonly asked uh, about the vaccine and what they should inform themselves about before they, they go and take it. We, when we started this back in January, there were less than 1% of the nation that had been vaccinated by that, this time. Now we have gotten to the point where we have nearly 40% of the people that have been vaccinated. I would just like to see us get to about 40% more. It seems like we're, we're doing about 10% a week uh, these days, which is a lot more than it was when we first got started, so that uh, it's looking much, much better uh, than before. Until we have about 80%, we may indeed see a, lot, a large change in what goes on in this nation. This is, and I'm proud to say this, my 60th year in nursing practice. I graduated from, uh, from uh, my school of nursing at North Carolina A&T State University in 1961. So if you'll do the math, you know I've been around for a while doing this. And I will just tell you, I'm out here right now giving the vaccine and doing my work as a nurse because I heard that the nation needed to be vaccinated. And one day I said, well, I know how to do that. I've taught it uh, as a nurse in my time uh, in practice. And uh, I've certainly have given enough immunizations myself and other kinds of uh, injections to people. So I said, I think I can do that. Uh, it would be very helpful in increasing readiness and making sure that if in case we had to at some point in time go to uh, some place to, to be deployed, that we would indeed carry with us 
uh, as much assurance as we could uh, through having the vaccine that all would be well for us being there and for the population that we might have to deal with. So I would encourage them to take the vaccine. It's another opportunity, as we've known from before, to serve our country. And, uh, and we've done that before, so it's very easy to be able to get right back into that mood. Uh, being the optimist uh, that I am, I'm very happy to be able to be involved in uh, making sure that we're able to get rid of this uh, virus in our country. We need to do that because we need to get back to some kind of normalcy. Being able to stamp out the virus and to see to it that people get vaccinated uh, during this time. Very happy to be a part of that. And I uh, want to finally tell you to remember that Army medicine is Army strong. Hello everyone. Happy Juneteenth 2021. I'm Dr. Pamela Shambly, the very proud superintendent of Northampton County Schools. There are many activities we use to honor and celebrate Juneteenth, including a focus on education and self-development. To help break the glass ceiling in health, healing, and academics, we celebrate the contributions of Dr. Patricia E. Bath, an ophthalmologist and laser scientist. A graduate of Howard University College of Medicine, Dr. Bath focused on the prevention of blindness, especially in underserved populations. Despite experiencing racism, sexism, and poverty, she discovered and invented a device and technique for cataract surgery and received several patents for the work that can be found all around the world. She was a true pioneer and depicted the spirit of Juneteenth through her focus on health, healing, and academics. Happy Juneteenth 2021, everyone. Great day. This is a glorious time to celebrate Juneteenth. I am Terry Bell, Independent Sales Director from Mary Kay cosmetics and I want to wish all of the community, all of my friends, all of the organizers, all of the participants to have a great time in this Juneteenth celebration. One of the things I love doing is sharing information with people and you're going to get some wonderful information today and it's very, very important to recognize that your health is truly your wealth. It is the most valuable thing you can have. And in my business, I specialize in healthy skin. I teach people how to take care of their skin. And in addition to cleansing your skin, one of the most important things you can do is to use sunscreen. Contrary to anything you may have been told, African-American skin is extremely sensitive to light, and we must protect our health and our wealth and our prosperity and our understanding of our history. It all ties in together to make us knowledgeable, to make us aware, and to make us ready to build the kinds of future that we want for ourselves and for the generations to come. Happy Juneteenth. Keep up the good work committee. I am so honored to be a part of this today. God bless you all. Southern breeze bears a strange fruit. Blood on the leaves and blood at the root. Black body swinging from the southern trees. Strange fruit hanging from the poplar tree. Best of scenes of a gallant south. Bulging eyes. And twisted mouth, scent of magnolia, so sweet and fresh. Then the sudden smell 
of burning flesh. Here is the fruit for the groves to pluck, for the rain to gather, for the wind to suck, for the dream to rot. Here is a strange and be Hello everyone, my name is Christine Granger. I would like to read you a poem for Juneteenth. The title of the poem is The Life of a Doctor. As I wake up each morning to start my day, I ask God to help me along the way. I travel through so many halls and so many rooms from door to door. I see so many faces, some I met before. I greet them with a smile as I stand by their bed. I know they depend on me as they asked me to repeat what I said. I wish I could tell them all that they would be just fine. Some of them I leave smiling and some with tearful eyes. This life I chose at times is filled with a lot of stress. But if I've saved just one life, I know I've done my best. Every day I ask God to help me he gave me these gifted hands. The stress of a doctor is not easy, but I'm a part of God's master plan. Now that my day has ended, it's time for me to go home, but I'll return tomorrow, but this place feels like my home. Every day in court, I see young people come before me, primarily young African-American people, and it seems that they have lost hope. Sometimes their home lives are not so great. They may be dealing with poverty, uh, domestic violence, drug abuse, all sorts of things that come with living in a rural area where people try to use any and everything as a means for escape. So when I see them, what I want to tell them is just don't give up. Growing up in the rural part of Halifax County, I really didn't have much exposure to racism. And I realized there was a problem with racism was when I actually went away, uh, went to college, went to grad school in Indiana and moved back and started my organization. And I realized that racism existed on many levels, not just black and white but racism also existed within my own race. As in terms of not being accepted or being said I was acting too white um, because I was a little articulate, but having those conversations and bringing it to the table has been what I felt was more important because some things are deeper than race and we just use race as an excuse. Back in the slavery time, it was mostly black people that was doing all the work. Some of my family right now don't even know what year they was born in. I don't really exactly know myself. I was on the back of the truck coming from Enfield with the man that they were sharecropping with, and I was going to spend the night with them. And I saw some ropes back there behind the seat. I said, they're going to hang me, sure. Then I seen these ropes, because I knew about the people hanging folks back then. They don't do that as much now as they did then. I said, well, they sure gonna hang me today, sir. but that, that, that was just all in my mind. Nobody did anything to hurt me, but it was in my mind. Mm -hmm. I first experienced racism at the age of five um, in kindergarten. I was on my way home from school when a bigger boy, maybe third grade, came and punched me in the stomach. And he called me the N-word. And he told me never to talk to his little brother again. And so I was doubled over and I was crying. And I had a hard time processing that. Like, why would this 
third grader, this big boy, come punch me, a girl, in the stomach? And why did he call me that ugly name? Racism is, is everywhere. Um, but I was always raised to do the best at everything that I do. And that, uh, that other stuff really doesn't matter, just to keep on pushing. In the southeastern part of Halifax County, the resources are very limited. So in areas of recreation, uh, education, food, all those areas, and greatly, yes, health disparities, um, we have the highest number of amputations in the southeastern part of um, Halifax County. Um, one of the most challenging um, experiences I think that I have experienced as a student through Halifax County School System was the lack of resources um, that the school administration had. Um, and I did not realize that until I graduated and started school um, in Winston-Salem. That's when I realized how far behind we were. I will say that I do worry about schooling um, when my daughter, our youngest, my youngest does get school age, I'm a little hesitant and that's at least for Halifax and possibly the city schools, which of course I reside outside of that district. A lot of the foods now are processed, pre-bagged and all of that. So there is a barrier of getting healthy foods. What we call them is uh, food deserts because half the time all you have is like the corner store or you know, the the local grocery, which doesn't have fresh produce or most of the time fresh meat. We have to just keep supporting our, our farmers, you know, um, at the local farmers markets. Uh, there's quite a few uh, in Halifax County that we can go in and support the farmers. And so I think mainly it's just us, the consumers, just uh, supporting the farmers that's already there, that's putting in the work for us. I think we're coming to a place where America is really birthing into its purpose and what it's supposed to be. If we did pull together the black race, we'd be the strongest race in the country. People can't give up. We are the people and we must work together. I think we are evolving in a way, even though it may seem controversial, it may seem like it's a lot of chaos, but I think out of that will birth something that's beautiful to reflect what America has become. I wish, I wish you all the best as we celebrate the day when federal troops arrived in Galveston, Texas in 1865 to take control of the state and ensure that all enslaved people be free. Celebrating Juneteenth is an opportunity to reflect on the day of renewal and a time to honor and respect the sufferings of slavery. It is also a time to celebrate African American accomplishments throughout history with tolerance and respect for all cultures. It was my honor to co-sponsor House Bill 1607 recognized the Juneteenth National Freedom Day during the 2007 session of the North Carolina General Assembly. I was proud in 2007 when the governor signed House Bill 1607 into law, recognizing the 19th day of June. Each year is Juneteenth National Freedom Day to commemorate the end of slavery in the United States. I wish you all the best as you celebrate this special day, and to please let me know if I can ever be of a service to you in the future. God bless you, and God bless you. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Reverend Edwin Horsley. On behalf of the Roanoke-Salem Missionary Baptist Church family, we wish you a happy Juneteenth. Let's continue to celebrate the great things God has done for African-American people and to make this nation a better place to live.